That was uh, a good screen cut off there for a second. All right, we're live. I, I sent Tim an invite, so he might be joining us. But let's just give people a little while to trickle in and stuff like that. Usually it takes takes a few minutes. <laughs> Ryan West is here. This guy's literally on every single chat, like first. Exactly 8 o'clock timestamp. <laughs> Ryan, where do you live? So, Adam, how's things in Colorado? You guys getting kind of back to business? Uh, yeah, things are good. Um, Sam, Trail, like riding wise and getting outside wise and things like that. What was that? Like just as far as like getting outside and. Yeah, um, uh, we've been getting out and to ride. Monday we had some really good rain, so we got out and did a nice rain ride. Um, and yeah, things are things are good. Um, I've been getting some of my own projects done in my shop. Um, yeah. Shepard, Adam is building a, well, why don't you tell him? Cause Shepard's a machinist, so he'll probably appreciate it. Oh, nice. Uh, so I've been working on a, uh, manual espresso machine for quite a while now. I actually, I've been thinking about it for like five years, but I finally actually just started machining it. Um, and it's actually all done. Take another five years. I need to, uh, no, it's all done. I need to pull it back apart and like polish it up, tweak a couple things. Um, but it's pretty rad. It's um, it's all manual. There's no boiler or anything, so it's just super simple and cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, how do you? So does it have like a big lever arm that's gonna like put it under a real high pressure? Yeah, it's got like a like a piston. Um, so you fill the cylinder with water and then piston goes down and uh, pressurizes through the porta filter with the grounds in it. So, nice. yeah. Sounds like a good COVID project. Uh, it was. Um, it was finally like a cool project that didn't involve bikes or cars because that's really all I typically do. And well, it's basically like, like making an engine piston. So it's not really that far of a stretch for you. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely nice to uh, get my mind on something else for a bit. Well, I, I got I got into uh, machining from uh, wanting to make bike parts back in the late 80s, early 90s. And I started as a machinist wanting to learn. Like I was I served an apprenticeship for the UAW and was like nice. make, making parts back in the early 90s. And then actually went to go work for a company called KPMC that was um, – uh, we were adjacent to the Ringlay building when Ringlay was in Trenton, New Jersey. And so, oh, okay. so we were we were the machine shop that made all of those purple parts on all those bikes that you see. That's uh, right. We, we made the the Bubba hubs. We made those 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 stems. Uh, we made headsets, seat posts, all those purple parts that came out of my uh, came uh, out of my fingers. And so right. I I think what turned me off to the bike world was after I made 110 hubs in one night and had to countersink all the the you know all 64 holes like 110 times a night oh and man I was like i don't want to make bike parts anymore i want to do something else <laughs> yeah definitely um yeah i entered the machining world uh working at a medical machine shop um yeah. my dad was an engineer and my oldest brother is an engineer um so they kind of turned me off of the sitting in front of a computer in an yeah. office kind of thing. Um, but I was always hands-on and um, I got really lucky and got this job out in Colorado at a, a medical machine shop running uh, the maintenance department. Um, so I was, a, I was able to learn everything about the machines and yeah. um, get a lot more in-depth um, machining background um, and stay late and work on projects and stuff. So yeah, I kind of got tired of um, doing the like the medical parts that you never see the finished product. Yeah, like there's there's nothing really that cool about it. So that's why I, I got out of that and got into bikes. Do something a little bit more interesting. Yeah, see, I did the opposite. I was in uh, into bikes, and then I got into manufacturing machining for twenty years, and then. Um, 
and then now, now I'm, you know, I'm retired from manufacturing. I worked for a company called Mazak. Have you ever heard of Mazak machines? Yeah. Yeah, I was one of their their five axis uh, high temp alloy cutting specialists. So. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. It was it was brutal though. It's a lot of work. Bike yeah. shops bike shops are much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. An easy life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Of course. Uh, Shepard, what year did you work at that machine shop? I was the one next to Ringley. Um, that was ninety two through ninety nine uh, ninety one ninety two through ninety three ninety four somewhere in that ballpark. And then I actually worked. I was building frames with vicious cycles up at New Paltz, Carl Schlemois. So yeah. I was doing all of his his frame mitering. So I left Ringley and then went to work for another shop and then was working as a machine tool guy and then actually was making frames with Carl Schlemowitz for a season or two. So um, I was doing the head tube, uh, I was turning the head tubes, um, doing all the mitering and uh, and any, anything else that he needed machining. So for a while, I've been in the bike business, like making stuff for a while and then and then got out of it and began, got more into manufacturing. And now I've done, gone full circle because I, after a year of, of life, long-term life of manufacturing stuff, my passion for bikes and riding bikes became sort of secondary. And so that's why we bought the shop because yeah. like, it's what I want. That's what I got into this for. So I won't, again, I figured retail, retail is an easy bit, easy thing these days. So I figured it was a good, good place to jump into it. Um, I, I saw Carl at Port Jervis the other day. Oh, did you? Yeah. And I also did, when I was on Schwinn the first year, so I guess it was 96, we were out of there. Um, I got a Cannondale pepperoni fork for my Schwinn homegrown frame that I was using for trials, but the, but the fork was significantly lower. So the guys from Ringlay, which I thought might have been you, uh, made me like this 10 millimeter tall yeah. bottom race for my yeah. fork to oh. jack it up a little bit. I was, uh, yeah, so we were we were the shop for Ringley for um, I, I don't know when I left. I think it was like ninety four, um, but yeah, it was uh, ninety three, ninety four. I not, I don't remember exactly, but they, Carl, what's that? Carl the Anyways, yeah. cool. All right, well, we got forty people in here now, so we should probably do introductions. Okay. Um, I mean, it's my channel, so hopefully everybody knows who I am. Uh, down below, we have Adam Prosize. He's our main fabricator at Reeb. If you've watched any of the other Reeb chats that we've done and continue to be doing, Adam will be joining me for those. He's pretty much anything and a super sick rider too. Awesome to ride a bike. That's somebody that same bike and holds the bike and rides really hard. Definitely do some extra level of confidence. And up in the right-hand corner, we have the bike. Shop, ten of the workshop crew. So, you guys, introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Shepard Rinker, the owner, um, and uh, and the, uh, the 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 tap the tap handler. And then this is uh, Noah Rinker. Hi. So Noah, <laughs> Noah 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 does odd jobs around the shop. He actually works there, so he's but he's six, six percent on it. Nice. <laughs> so, and how long have you had the, the bike shop? Uh, we bought it. In, uh, it's, uh, we bought it six years ago. It'll be seven years in March, and then uh, uh, it's been around since the seventies. It's like a staple in the in the in the area in Bergen, northeastern Bergen County. Pretty much every, every pretty much almost every bike shop owner in the area has worked at my shop at some point in time and gone off on their own. So, really, yeah, nice. Now, Glenn from, Glenn from Piermont worked there. Uh, Alan Albert from Westwood Cycle worked there for a while. So it's, it's been a staple for a while. Awesome. It's, so it's the same building. The Watch Antenna Fly Bicycle Workshop is our read partner in the, you know, basically Northeast. And I would consider a pretty high-end mountain bike shop, but you do a lot of road over there too as well, right? Uh, mostly gravel. We don't really, like, I mean, we do, we sell road bikes. It's not like we're, uh, we don't sell them. But at the same token, there's not many people that want to get their hands dirty with, uh, you know, rebuilding forks and brake bleeds and, and, you know, like there's an art and a knack to knowing how to troubleshoot a Creek when it comes from a full suspension bike. And you either have years of experiencing experience that can diagnose those problems quickly and make it affordable. And if you can't, like you're like most shops, 
in the area focus on road. If you bring a creaky bike to them, um, you know, it's it, the, the process can be anywhere. You know, it's just elongated because we got guys that are that ride that know how to diagnose noises and problems. And then we also have like as a machinist, as a bike shop owner, and as a machinist, like we get all those jobs that no other shop will touch because between me and Kevin, who's our, who's my uh, manager and partner on uh, the store, like he's a fabricator, um, metallurgist, he builds all, everything, uh, motorcycle mechanic, like we can fix anything and we can do it efficiently and quickly. I mean, we will, like, like I said, like we've, we're sort of renowned for, we bought the place that was called the bicycle workshop and it happens to work very, the name works very well for who we are. So, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, not afraid of mountain bikes is one thing, and in, 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 the, in the Northeast, there's you know the, the shops, in, especially in New York State, New York metropolitan area, like it's hard to run a mountain bike store. Like people want to ride bikes, they want to test ride them. Um, we're eight miles or ten miles from New York City, uh, and so we can we have 30, 30 to thirty five demos in season for about bikes to ride, including the re squeebs, um, and so like. That, that's a rare thing for a shop in New York City. They can't have demos. So people that want to test bikes, we're a destination location. And even in the middle of this COVID thing, we have people, our bikes are going out for demos regularly, uh, as Jeff knows, because you sent one out the other day. So like it's, you know, having the inventory and having, we, we only have rollable inventory. I don't stock mountain bikes. I don't. Everything is a demo. Um, we pay for it out of our own pocket. We make that sacrifice and, um, and that's because it's important for us to make sure that people make the right choice. So sweet. Um, do we want to take a question real quick? So, and then, I, and then, I, then we need to get into why we're here, but we let's let some more people trickle in. So this one's a pretty good question. I'll put it up on the, on the board. What do you guys think about those modern slack head tube angles? Is it a proper way of evolution or should we get a steep, should we get a step back? I personally prefer dual slalom frames from 2006 to 2012. Well, it's actually, two, it's 2012. So he's got a long way to go. The future. <laughs> the future. Yeah, so we're falling right in. We're kind of on the beginning of that time frame. <laughs> Still got a way to go. Adam, what do you think? You like them slacker than most, so. Uh, yeah, I've tried... Uh, the squeeb that I raced, uh, last year was 62 and a half degrees. Um, and that was full-time trail bike. Uh, that was going out for 40 mile, 40 mile rides. Um, I think it's awesome, but it also depends on what you're riding. Um, we have a lot of steep terrain out here and, uh, slack head angles work really well for that. Um, if you're in the Midwest or, um, where it's a little bit flatter, um, you're, if you're, you know, sitting on the seat a lot more pedaling around, you're probably going to want something a little bit steeper. Um, yeah, it, it really depends on, on where you ride. What do you see trending by you, Shepard? Um, 65 to 68, uh, for trail bikes. I think it's like that's sort of a sweet spot. Um, uh, it's just, just, I think, and I'd like to actually know Adam's thoughts on like modern fork offsets have had some play in the way the steeper head tube, slacker head tube angles still track well and don't feel all cumbersome. I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of stuff that's happened with geometry that's sort of allowed that to work in the past. Like you just slap a 65 degree head tube angle on something and the fork offset wasn't right. Your, your axle, the ground was off, the bike rode weird. But I think like the suspension manufacturers have sort of honed in on, on getting you know getting the the correct you know the correct offset and the correct way the bike should feel without making feel too floppy and still able to climb. I mean I think that's the the, the, the key in a trail bike for us, which is finding that sweet spot and not, not making it feel like a lumbering bike that that's hard to turn. So yeah, um, with the fork offsets, um, since I'm six four. Um, like Jeff, um, the fork offsets kind of work differently for us. Um, we've got a lot more, uh, body weight forward over the bike. Um, so I'm actually still running a 51 millimeter offset fork. Uh, I mean, really for two reasons. Uh, first reason, 
I'm not rich and I typically keep the same fork for a while, um, at least a year or so, year and a half. So I haven't really got into the shorter offsets, but um, I totally understand why they work. Um, but it's a, it's a really good option for somebody that really mm -hmm. wants to be picky about their bike setup um, because you can buy different offsets with the same fork model. So um, if you feel like you're not able to get enough weight on that front wheel or your braking traction isn't there. Um, I just got or, roasted on my own, my own live chat. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's the, the multiple fork offsets are really good. Um, that way you're not just stuck to, you know, one thing because I mean, up until just a couple of years ago, um, fork offset, uh, was determined why, by what, uh, fork manufacturer you used also because right. everybody uses something a little bit different. So it's still not really, um, agreed upon thing. So, um, yeah, the best thing to do is, uh, just try them out. Uh, you can do that with demo bikes too. Uh, we have a couple different offsets on our bikes. So um, you can kind of just get the feel by um, trying different forks out. So cool. I've, I've ridden both bikes with both fork offsets. I notice it more on my hardtail than I do on my suspension bike. And I mean, I could notice it, but it's not like, oh my God, I can't ride one or the other. I think... Uh, I like, I have 40, 44s on both of mine. I like them, but the 51, I, I rode the hardtail and the squeeb last year with a 51 and that felt fine too. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So let's, let's talk about, cause we're starting to get some questions already. So let's, let's talk about why we're here first of all. And a lot of it has to do with Tenafly becoming a Reeb dealer last year. And then Noah being a shredder and Adam being a mad scientist bike designer. So it's kind of like the perfect storm. So how did the how did the whole Trail Boss Junior project start? You approached us, right, Shepard? Yeah, I mean, I just like, you know, the 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 issue that when you and I, when we all grew up with bikes when we were Noah's age was the technology was not, I mean, technology wasn't as good as it is now anyways, but the technology for kids was you get what you get, you don't get upset, and you ride what you ride. But when you have talent, and you're a good rider, you're constant. He was, he, Noah's been such a good rider that his equipment never measured up to his ability to ride. And so we would make small tweaks, like put it even small, like putting a suspension fork or putting, you know, he's, I'll give you a good example, like, uh, you know, what we call ratcheting or clutching through technical terrain. You do it for technique, Jeff. He has to do it because his, his cranks are two inches from the ground all the time. So like, Finding a hub that has high engagement, you wouldn't you think that that's an expensive, ridiculous thing for a kid's bike? But for for Noah, it's 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 it, it makes him makes him able to get up and over obstacles and pedal through rock rock you know rock gardens in New Jersey. It sounds awesome, and it sounds awesome, right? Um, that's the most important thing. So so the first thing was like you know again, I'm a bike shop owner, I'm a bike shop geek. Um, I think I've spent enough money in my lifetime on my own bikes, and it's time to start you know, working on, on my son who needs the technology more than I do. Like, I'm not going to get much faster at this point in time. Um, he has the ability to. Uh, and I just, I thought, you know, again, I, I don't know. We were just, we just wanted a, to have a bike. You know, a lot of it came, it's like, the, it's like the, the chicken before the egg, right? So Maxi's make, Maxi's makes a Minion DHF and DHR and 24 inch. Manitou introduced a new fork. Um, we were able to find a short pair of, pet, uh, set of crank sets. You re agreed to make a, a, a bike that had wide enough spacing to fit those, that tire in there and the wheel in there. And so like, like, let's, let's do, a, let's do this project and make a proper kid's bike that again. And I think, I mean, you should really ask Noah what he think, thinks about steel because he's been riding a aluminum bike for a while. Um, and it was, um, and just, I know what steel feels like because you know that's all there was when we started, Jeff. I mean, we had steel bikes and that was it. Aluminum came by later, um, but for a kid like that doesn't have a rear suspension bike or doesn't have a didn't have a good one at the time, like every advantage counted. And steel has a, a basically a compliant feel to it that kind of gives them a little rear suspension. So I think we approached Adam 
um, I approached you, and then uh, um, I think I think it's Adam's quick response with a drawing that got us hooked. Um, and they were in the middle of you guys were in the middle of like jamming out other stuff, and so I didn't want to be too pushy, but at the same token, like I wanted to get him a bike before you know because he out he suddenly outgrew his twenty inch bike, and so we were in like he had no bike for about three months. So um, and then these guys sent the drawing and. It was perfect. Like you could tell, we can get a water bottle on Spike, and there was like sixty-six degree head tube angle. Right? What else do you like about it? Um, the uh, uh, that's all good. Right, so. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here, and we're gonna pull up the picture of that first that first drawing. So that is all right here. So this is where this is what we started with. So. When you when you do, dove into the geometry, Adam, what what did you see as like the biggest problem with making a kid's bike to to be light, to be maneuverable? Like, what did you address? What did you and Shepard talk about as being the biggest problems of a kid's bike? Um, well, first off, uh, the the difficult part was was um, wrapping my head around, you know what style of riding Noah was going to be doing um, and, and really making it, you know, a shred worthy hardtail that actually looked like a cool mountain bike. Um, you see a lot of kids bikes these days um, that just don't look proportionally correct. Um, and there, there's a lot of things that really um, go into that. Like they're, they're trying to make it fit, um, you know, a four or five year span or something, or maybe not even that much, maybe a three or four year span of, of kids. And uh, so we actually looked through a lot of uh, different manufacturers, frame manufacturers of what uh, Shepard really kind of had in mind. And then, uh, then we kind of put the Reeb touch on it. And uh, my big thing was um, getting the standover really low um, so one thing that we noticed with a lot of kids bikes is the front triangles are huge and, uh, especially for like, um, I, I guess you'd call this like an all mountain hardtail, like a kid's all mountain hardtail. Um, you just want it to be nice and low. Um, you have the limitations of fork length and stack height. So, um, pretty much run the shortest head tube as possible, but um, you can really go with a low seat tube. And we pretty much made the front triangle small enough just to fit a water bottle. Yeah, uh, this is the first drawing, isn't it, Adam? We, we, you, you had a second one that has, you move. Yeah, so this is the, this is the lower standover. So right. this one would not fit a water bottle or it was very tight. Um, also, I think we talked about there were some changes with the um, seat tube. Um, yeah, we found it. I found a dropper that fit. That was another thing. Yeah, yep. so this the, is like the OG drawing. <laughs> yeah, so pretty much the only thing that changed. Um, oh yeah, this this is uh, sixty seven degree head angle. So we went to sixty six degree head angle um, to get it even slacker. Um, and it's now 65 because of uh, he put the 124 on it and he loved it. Yeah. So that that was the, that was the other consideration. It was the you know we, we want Noah to grow into this bike and when you grow into a bike you put a longer fork on it pretty much um because you, after a month <laughs> yeah, you start to push it a little bit harder you you feel the bike out and and you know you want a little bit more travel and um so yeah, the second drawing, uh, we just bumped the standover up a little bit. So the, the top tube goes almost straight into the seat stays. Um, fits a normal sized water bottle, which is rad. Um, but honestly, the biggest challenge uh, what, with this bike is um, we spoke a little bit in the beginning about building an aluminum one. And um, we don't we don't build aluminum hardtails too often. We really love that, that steel ride quality. So um, building a kid's bike, that's not only lightweight that can compare to aluminum weight. Um, it's difficult to find tubing that 
uh, triple butted tubing that is short enough for a kid's bike. So I did a lot of research on finding good triple butted tubing that actually had the butt lengths that were short enough that um, we were actually making a bike that was strong and lightweight. Um, so I think um, in the future, we can probably still get a little bit more weight out of this frame, but it um, as is, it's a little bit under four pounds, which I think is pretty amazing for a bike that is built to, you know, take it all. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's built, you, you can see it. It's like, I think it, it's basically a mini version of what you're riding, Jeff. It's like the, even the bracing in the, uh, on the, on the chain between the chain and the seat stays with the brake bridge, like you're pro not sure he's ever going to use that, but man, it's like, um, it's, 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 it, you can tell it's, it's stout. It's not, you know, he's, it would be, it would be very, very hard for him to break this bike. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's, that's something that's very important to us. Um, we don't want to just build weight weenie bikes to hit a, a weight number. We want to build bikes that last forever. And, you know, that, you know, you're not going to have problems with, um, and, you know, problems are even like rocks getting thrown up on the trail and denting tubes. Um, the um, top tube on Noah's bike is like uh, in the center, it's like 18 or 20 thousandths thick. That is thin. I mean, that's borderline being able to um, pinch it and be able to flex the tube with your fingers. Um, it's all heat treated chromoly though. So it's very strong tubing. It's just very lightweight, very thin stuff um, that for, I don't know how much Noah weighs, probably 70 pounds. Guess. You guessed wrong. Jeff, what's Here your guess? pockets full of chocolates, maybe. <laughs> Jeff, what's your guess? Adam's totally wrong. I would guess that Noah is 52 pounds. Exactly. 52? Yeah. 52. How old are you, Noah? Um, Eight, right? Nine. My son Max is 10 and he's 100 pounds. So us Lenoski boys are a little, a little big. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right. So let's talk about your components spec and everything. Like, how'd you come up with these parts? 52. Um, so, um, first of all, I, mean, uh, I, I want to give a big shout out to a couple companies. Um, uh, first of all, Matt, again, not a, not plugging anybody, but Manitou, um, made a real kid's fork. Um, the minimum rider weight on this fork. It, so this is a 24 inch fork and it goes from hundred millimeters to 145 in the same fork. And you can, you can, it's just using spacers to change the travel, no air sleeve change. The other thing is the rider weight on the fork, the minimum rider weight is 40 pounds and it works. It's got small bump. Um, so like, that's a, a pretty, excuse my language, a pretty ballsy move for a fork manufacturer to make a bike, a, a fork that's specific for kids. But it's like, again, we're, you know, you know, no, I hear about. So, so they, um, so again, and they, they made it. And so like, I want to, they should be rewarded for it because, um, it works. It's got small bump. It's got, I mean, it's got. It's very, very lively. He uses all of the travel, um, and it's it's pretty amazing. So we kind of built it around the fork to start with, um, and then uh, uh, also Sun Ringlay is now making kids' wheels. So these this the the wheel set on it came from Sun Ringlay. They make um, uh, they can make these wheels with uh, we did 142 uh, through axle in the rear and a 110 boost in the front um, with the 24 inch rim tubeless ready. Um, and it comes with an XD driver. It comes, uh, I mean, it's like pretty dope and it comes with different end caps. So you can go on the rear wheel from a 135 QR to a 142, um, through axle. So like, again, having the parts to put on the bike made it easy for me and Adam. Um, the yeah. only thing sort of like a weird sort of part, which is awesome is the trail craft makes a, the cranks on it, which are 140 millimeters long. Um, because again, if he ran a normal 142, you'd have to drop the seat down a little bit more or one, uh, 155. I'm sorry. He would have to drop the seat down a little bit more 
um, to get, you know, to get at that crank. And then he's also now dealing with pedal strike, which again, when you're that low to the ground, like the kid needs to be on top of where his pedals are all the time. Um, so that's, it was those kind of components. And then SDG, of course, um, and answer and pro tape are all making, making kids bars and grips. So, I mean, we, we made the analogy and actually we had something on our Instagram page, um, which is for Noah riding a normal 30 millimeter, 31 millimeter grip is like him holding a Coke can as a bar, as a, as a bar diameter. So, exactly. um, so again, these guys are making, you know, 20 millimeters, uh, answer is making even smaller. I think the bars are, the grips are 20 millimeters. Um, they're tiny. Yeah, they're tiny. It's and the so, cutest, cutest handlebars I've ever seen before. <laughs> but, but again, it's all these things that these companies are making that like, again, now all you need is the frame set and you guys are now providing it, which is like you slap on all these parts. The only thing that's an adult part is the KS uh, Lev Integra Post of when he's now got a one up on there now because he couldn't get the 100 millimeter. Believe it or not, the 100 millimeter uh, one up is almost the same height as the KS uh, 80 millimeter. So yeah, uh, that's the only part that's changed from this picture. Um, but other than that, I mean, like having all these parts and then like, you know, Shimano 11 speed, this picture was taken with a long cage derailleur. He now has, we, the mid cage works on, on 1142. Nice. Um, so again, we sort of like, you know, the, so the cage is now up another two, another two inches or so when it's yeah, down. I feel like I got to take credit for that one, Shepard. You do. Actually. We did have the conversation. Hey, Noah, don't. Don't blame me, Noah. Originally, your dad was going to put 12 speed on there, and I said that the derailleur was going to practically be touching the ground on a 24 inch wheel. So I steered him in the direction of 11 speed just because it would have a little bit more ground clearance. Yeah. And then the short cage works, with, despite what Shimano says, the short cage, the, their mid cage works with a 42. So that's that's helped a lot too. So we that from this picture, that's that's the long cage. The short cage is another, like, I think half an inch or inch higher. So um, nice. nice. So, so those are the answer bars and everything. No, that's the SDG parts um, on this. Oh, okay. we, had, we had those. Uh, that's the only thing. So SDG, they also make the saddle. Um, yep. So SDG provided Noah with the saddle, the bars, and the grips. Um, and then Shimano, uh, of course, Shimano is always uh, always super, super great about getting new kids on bikes. And uh, um, so they hooked up Noah with the uh, um, – and then I – with all the, the drivetrain parts. Uh, and then I had a – you know, we had – touch it all off with the, um, my old XTR four piston, uh, two piston brakes, which every kid needs. Right. Um, <laughs> we had an old, old set of X, XTR two pistons laying around. So we threw those on there, but, um, it's very, I mean, again, like a, a two piston works great for him. And so, uh, and then, uh, crank brothers makes a small and large size pedal. Um, so we put the small pedals on there. So like I said, like everything fits him and it's like, again, the, the you know, that's why, we came to read because Noah is on the smaller side of a 24 inch. He was just, this is his first 24 inch bike. So like he, he's going to have time. You can see where the seat is right now. He, that seat, that seat post, you know, with the, with the, and the one, the other reason I got the one up is it's a 120 that can be reduced to hundred millimeters. So we'll be able to bring that seat, seat post up a little bit more. He'll have this bike for a good two, two years. And then it's going to be a feeding frenzy for who wants to buy it after he's done with it. So all right, so let's go to this picture and uh, and talk to Noah a little bit. So Noah, what kind of bike were you riding before this? Um, I was riding a Spawn twenty inch hardtail, and um, Alchemy uh, repainted it for me. Gotcha. And when you got on when you got on this bike for the first time, what were your what were your impressions? Um, it was like it was awesome, and I had to get used to like. Getting a bike that big because it's four inches bigger, and yeah. it felt weird at first, but when I took it on the trail, I loved it. So, if you're watching, I'm gonna type in the comment section your uh, Instagram page for the bike shop. So, tell me what else you like about this bike. I'm gonna type this comment so people could go there and see some videos of you shredding this thing. Um, it's just. It climbs well. It's like, and it descends well. It's, it does. It just, it's like, it's poppy. It's fun. It doesn't feel sluggish. It's, it's amazing. Mm. Oh, four things nice. Skinny as well. Skinny as well. He love. Noah loves doing skinny stuff. So. Yeah, skinny. Nice, Adam. What did you end up with a bottom bracket height for that bike? 
I believe it's 40 millimeters of drop. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I, so that, that'll give you a nice, good, stable bike for balance lines and yeah. stuff like that. And, and and bottom, Shepard, did I put that down there, right? What's that? I put your Instagram handle there, right? Bicycle underscore workshop. Yeah, that's it. And then you can do, yeah. And then you can see Shared Lenar. This is, is Noah's Instagram page. Gotcha. Sweet. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and then again, I, I got to say, so I know Noah has his own, you know, no one knows that the, what the bike made him allow him to do. But as a parent that follows behind a kid that's, that's running, that's riding, um, you really can see progress uh, in a, in a, in a way that the kid probably the child can't see. Um, and again, from riding as many years and I'm like a Nike instructor, I'm okay. at riding a bike. Um, but the, the, his progress, uh, when he got on this bike was, I mean, it was, uh, and I, I saw Mike Coven is on this, uh, chat group. And then so is Mark Eckert. And so is Mara Miller. These guys saw they, I mean, they've ridden with Noah since he's gotten this bike. And he's now able to ride on adult group rides with us and like not, we're not waiting for him. So to see progress like that in a nine-year-old and then when it goes downhill, like nobody can keep up with him. So, uh, because he's, imagine he's getting around turns in, in, in half the time. Uh, and then he can, someone actually, we were with another guy the other day that was riding he says in the, in the time it took him to do one jump, Noah had done four jumps in the same space. So it's like, um, and then having the bike that's poppy that he can get off the ground. Um, and again, he has another bike that's for the bike park. Um, and it's not the same. You watch him ride and it's not the same. And he thinks he's going faster on the other bike, but Strava would, uh, oops, I said Strava, uh, his times would, would just tell different. He actually, on one of the downhill local black diamond by, downhill trails, he actually beat my best time uh, two days ago on this bike and was like, ah, and that wasn't a very good run, dad. And I'm like, okay, whatever, dude. You make him do the dishes to put him back in his place? <laughs> <laughs> no, how awkward is that when you beat your dad in a downhill? It's weird. Are you like, you did good, Dad? Yeah. Go, Dad. <laughs> like, keep with it. I rode Jungle Habitat the other day, and I would probably – and it's like there's so many trees at him, it's ridiculous. I'm like a bull in a china shop, like trying to make all these tight turns because you're just so tall and 800-millimeter yeah. wide bars. Like it just doesn't fit. It's like the densest, narrowest trail ever, and I bet no would totally smoke me out that thing. And <laughs> So much faster. So that Mark, Mark, Eckert, Mark Eckert made a, can, uh, a comment because Mark rode with him for the first time since COVID-19 the other day, uh, safely, of course. Uh, and Mark PR uh, the same segment that Noah beat me on uh, chasing Noah the other day. He's very fast. And it's like the ability to make turns quickly. Again, you know, it's, when we get with our longer wheelbases, right, it's like we, we can get around them only so fast. Um he can get around them quicker, just naturally get through turns faster. Oh um, yeah. If he's picking a totally different line than you and I can pick. So it's just, it's interesting to see. So again, then he's got mad skills too. So that doesn't. So Ian just commented, have I ridden six mile narrow trees? I think it's fish uh, at jungle. Fish makes uh, six miles seem vast and, and wide open. It's like that tight. It's kind of annoyingly tight. So, Jungle was made for what, 20, 22 inch bars? <laughs> I don't know. Like I was riding 800 millimeter wide bars in there the other day, and it was just constant enduro like wheelies through everything. I think, yeah, I think uh, if you talk to Tom and Dave, they made it for, I think it's like 22 was the, when they were, yeah, it's hard to get through. Yeah. So, one other thing is, you know, to talk about the, the kids' bike, we're launching the Trail Boss Jr. It's available for sale now. It's obviously a super high-end bike. It's not a it's not a bike for for anybody, but if you have the ability to shred like Noah does, you know, it's going to pay dividends. But it also just opens up the conversation of our ability to custom manufacture bikes at Reed. You know, the kids bike is a perfect springboard to to talk about that a little bit. So how many custom custom bikes are you doing now? What percentage of the bikes nowadays, Adam, are you manufacturing that are customized in some way? Um, I would say, 
I would consider custom all the way down to custom colors. Right. Um, and I would say it's got to be 80% custom. Um, just in the shop today, we did a, I finished a lick skillet in uh, City Lights, which is a custom color for the lick skillet. Um, and then I also did a kind of, um, I guess, throwback, but um, we did a 650 frame um, in Tempest Cream. Uh, and then we also added some extra um, water bottle mounts to the bottom of the down tube. So there's always, um, it seems like even if somebody orders just a stock production frame, um, people like to customize by doing, uh, you know, extra bottle mounts or, um, you know, custom color, whatever. Um, most of them are that, but in the queue coming up, we've got a lot of um, the custom frame geometry stuff. Uh, we've got a lick skillet on order with uh, some custom uh, flat bar geometry, also geometry for uh, the MRP Baxter fork, which is the suspension gravel fork, um, and then your front end for flat bars instead of drop bars. Uh, we've got a dual crown hardtail build coming up, which is going to be pretty wild. Uh a 180 travel MRP hazard or no, not hazard. Sorry. MRP Bartlett, uh, Bartlett, Bartlett. fork um, on the front of a hardtail. I think we settled on 63 and a half degree head tube. So that's going to be a pretty wild um, hardtail setup. Um, and yeah, lots of custom colors. I sprayed like 10 different paint samples today for customers. And Adam, are you doing the paint too? Yeah, I mean, I'm the only, technically, I, well, I guess until just a couple of days ago, I was still the only one on payroll. So um, I am bringing back in Sam uh, on Monday. Uh, Sam does uh, most of our steel bike welding and fabrication. Um, he also designed the new Lick Skillet and Sam's Pants. So it'll be awesome to have him back in the shop. Um, we pretty much released both of those bikes, uh, got a bunch of orders for them, and then we closed. Uh, yeah, Colorado had the full stay at home. Like it, was, it was completely shut down. And and if you've ever seen on any of the the Reeb Instagrams or my YouTube channel, it's a it's a small shop. So to have a few guys in there, you just couldn't safely do it. So now yeah. we're finally able to like get them back in there and figure out workarounds to to get some bikes done because the demand seems to be there, you know, like people want to ride bikes right now. Yep. Um, yeah. It was just challenging for the month of April to, to do it with the stay at home orders and all that. Yeah. Especially, I mean, for, for bike, bike companies, I mean, we pretty much closed right in our busiest time, uh, which was difficult because um, we got a big backlog going of um, our our new lineup this year, a lot of people ordering bikes and then it was tough to just close down. So we tried to do as much as we could to uh, um, keep things going just as much as we could outside of the shop. But uh, now that I'm back in the shop, just getting caught up on a lot of stuff is, is um, yeah, getting caught up is, is real right now. So, so now Shepard, you, you sell, you sell a lot of bikes, you know, a lot of different brands, you sell a bunch of Reebs. Um, what do you see as like the biggest custom option people want? Um, I, I, that's a tough question. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think just personalizing the bikes in general. I mean, I think that, um, just trying to have something different that other people don't have. have yeah. Some have something different, um, to, um, because honestly the bikes ride so well these days, it's really, um, I mean, everything, everything is, I'm not saying that everything is really good, but most things are most bikes that we sell and the brands we bring into the store ride very, very well. Um, and there's a sort of a niche for like every customer and sort of expectation as to what, how bikes are going to ride. Um, I, I think it's mostly, it's just the builds themselves. I mean, like the, this, you know, the squeeb is a pretty, it's a, 
uh, for a full suspension bike, it's like, you know, you've got a bike that's semi custom because you can change the travel on it. You can change the, um, uh, you know, you can change the entire bike basically, you know, with one or two, you know, components. And so I think that, um, I just, I just think that in, in general, bikes are just so good that, I mean, for, for hardtails, I think like, I was, it's funny cause I'm, I, I was going to, you guys said that you were really busy, Adam. I was going to give you another order for myself, but um, uh, we can do that later. But like, I'll give you an example. Like we, I have a customer and including myself that like I'm committed to, you know, at least one bike with access. I'd like to have a bike with no, you know, we've had customers just want to have no, nothing. They just want to have a brake line going to the rear. Um, and they yeah. want to strand access. That seems to be a big fad these days, which is just like, they're, they're, they're going in all, you know, they're going in all, they're, they're, they're no going back. Once, once exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, we just, you know, in a couple of years, people are going to be selling clamp on derailleur uh, stops again. Or sending it back and have them re weld it, repaint it, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we just uh, built a squeeb, well, a couple months ago now, but the one that was uh, chrome gold, uh, that one was specced for full access. So, um, it has no uh, no derailleur guides on the chain stays, and all of the um, cable guides on the frame are just single guides. So it looked super clean, but it was definitely it had to take some thought of like, oh well, uh, especially on the squeeb since we um, the machined bottom bracket cluster, um, we machined that slot into the the bottom bracket cluster for the internal routing um and just based on when he ordered a bike um we had a we had a batch of those already machined so he ended up just plugging that hole but it's like maybe, yeah man, maybe we, well man. we could have uh we could have just like made it you know we could have just not machined that hole and made it full um full wireless everything even seat post steve steve's got good comments tonight Oh yeah, uh, Steve will be ordering a uh, ridiculous here pretty soon. He's been yeah. out on the demo a bunch lately. Yeah, Steve, you need to give the demo back and just order order your own bike already. <laughs> yeah, your demo's expired. Yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve has the benefit of being a short rider, so um, our small demo bikes um, don't typically get ridden as much as like our mediums and larges. So he usually gets a, a nice fresh demo to ride. <laughs> Steph called it out. Uh, his single speed is a demo bike that he just bought from us years ago. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, are you doing any custom geometry squeebs recently? Uh, you know, not recently. Um, the, so like last year, the V2, um, pretty much the requests that we had for custom geometry was uh, kind of in between sizes or lower standover. Um, so what we did this year uh, for the V3 was to make all of the bikes have lower standover and bump up the reach a little bit. So um, there's a there's a better... I guess we kind of learned through all the custom frames that we had last year and we just made the new bike, uh, the new V3 just kind of along those lines. So, um, I don't think that's that. that's one of the, yeah, not to cut you off. That's one of the cool things about working with a small brand when it doesn't become a one-off request anymore, you see that that's what people want. And we just designed it into the new bike. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't think we've had a a single um, uh, no, we haven't had a single custom V3 yet. As far as geometry, but geometry, they've all colors, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they've all been stock geometry. With uh, we have done a lot of custom colors. People have been uh, pretty excited about that. It's been fun too. We've been trying out some uh, translucent colors. So um, we haven't done any translucent or clears on steel because um, clear powder coat is um, porous and it can still allow moisture to enter the frame. So 
Um, in really wet climates, uh, you'll have some oxidation underneath the powder coat, only on clears. Um, so what's nice about the squeeb is we don't have to worry about um, it being, well, I mean, it can still oxidize, but it doesn't oxidize like steel does. Right. Um, so we've been doing some uh, tinted uh, clear powder coats. So um, clear or like translucent colored powder coats, which is neat because you can see all of the brush strokes in the aluminum and then like all of the welds and the heat affected zone in the weld. So it creates some pretty cool colors and, and just kind of adds to that, um, that hand built look. Um, when we do custom engravings on the frames too, um, it looks really awesome with the translucent colors. Yeah. So um, Noah, what's your, what's your plans? Uh, when you finish with air quote school, um, what's your summer riding plans? What do you hope to do? Um, we heard that Mount Creek is opening, which hopefully, is hopefully, hopefully. And we also heard that Thunder Mountain is opening. We're thinking about getting a house in Massachusetts. If, if they let us. They let us. Yeah, the, so the kids camp was canceled, sadly enough. Which one? Air Academy? No, uh, both camp, uh, both kids are, Noah, uh, Noah's supposed to go to Woodward for two weeks, Camp Woodward, shout Is out. Woodward canceled? Dang. No, not yet. They haven't canceled. They're, they're saying they're okay. over. My daughter, Katie, like is 1000% hoping that's not canceled and she'll be devastated. I, I, well, I, we're, yeah, we, we would be devastated too, but Daniela's camp was canceled. So like the idea of us staying here for him to go to two weeks at, uh, at Woodward, we're not sure what, how that's going to happen. So yeah. If but, I do right. go to this we're gonna be we're gonna be no matter what we're gonna be close to a bike park. That's the, that's the key is because he he needs to he needs to um, get fast enough to pay the bills this season and um, uh, can no longer rely on the bike shop for for any monetary help. He has to. We're we're putting all of our um, we're banking on Noah for all of us guys. So um, he's got to get fast. Um, it's we, either gonna be chores or race results, Noah. Either he's gonna get fast, or he's gonna have to. We're gonna have no food on the table, but no pressure, son. You're okay. You'll be fine. Um, I've got a funny. I've got a funny Woodward story. Um, so I grew up in Iowa, Midwest, uh, really far away from any Woodward, and just grew up always wanting to go ride those parks. And so when I moved to Colorado, I knew or I found out there was a Woodward at Copper Mountain. So. Uh, one day, my roommate and I went up to the ski resort to go ski or run. It was, I think it was like opening day, so it was terrible snow. But we brought our bikes also to go to Woodward, and they had a skate park and everything. And we show up with our bikes to ride the skate park, and it was two wedges on opposite sides of a room with like a box and a rail in the middle. And that was it. I was like, wait a minute, this is Woodward? <laughs> what was it? It was uh, Woodward Copper. This is years ago, but they had like oh, a little right, right. street, like skate park. But it was seriously just two wedges, like a hundred feet apart from each other and like a tiny little box and a rail in the middle of a room. It was, it was disappointing. <laughs> Not like that anymore, man. No. So Noah, but, I was trying to find pictures of my first ever bike, which was had a gas tank on it and a and a long banana seat. It looked like a motorcycle, and then I got a small seat and took the gas tank off and tried to make it look like a BMX bike. But you want to see the first ever kids reeb? Wait, is it mine? No. No. I think it's uh damn. It could be yours. It may be mine. Uh, what do you think? It looks cool. I think Noah needs the basket. Yeah. That's yeah. not a joke. That literally is the first ever. That's 20 inch, Adam, right? Yeah, yeah. that's 20 inch. So it was for Tim, who does our sales and, and runs the bike shop. That was for his son, Leo. And then it became his daughter's bike. So now it's actually Susanna's. Not Leo's daughter, Tim's daughter. Tim, yeah, Tim, Tim's. <laughs> right, right. It was Tim's son leo and now it's tim's daughter susanna he's got a, he's got a 26 inch right now he's on um 
He's on a frame. So before um, before you guys came along, we did have a kid's frame that was called the Dweeb. And it was a um, it was a frame that could be 24 inch that could grow into 26 inch. Um, but it was, you know, kind of nice that you guys came along because um, it's really good to have a dedicated frame for a wheel size. Yeah. Um, it just it works much better. Um, but yeah, his, he'll be able to grow into a 26 inch and it's very, that, um, that frame that Leo rides is very close to our, um, destroyer frame. It's, it's almost like uh, dirt jumper sized. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's the, I think that's what all along, that's what we did with Noah's 20 inch bike. So, I mean, the, the biggest challenge is, you know, you get a kid with a, you spend all the money on a, a kid's bike like this and. Um, and then he has a growth spurt. And but what we did with the, his 20 inch bike, which we thought was going to just go, you know, like we I put a lot of time and, and effort into that. And that actually we put um, some we made it into a dirt jumper. And I think we'll do the same thing with this bike. I think the angles, the whole geometry, like when he outgrows this and needs a 26 or 27.5, like a 20 inch dirt jumper for someone. I mean, it's like that's and I think that was part of the discussion that I had with you, which is like. Again, or if someone offers me a really juicy price for it, I'll sell it. But for the most part, you know, we said the same thing with his 20 inch bike was when he outgrows it, we're just, we'll sell it. And he's now using it as his dirt jumper. He used it yesterday too. So it's yeah. like, so we'll do the same thing with the Reeve is it's you guys does design the geometry perfectly that like when he, when he's ready to have a dedicated dirt jump bike, then he'll, we'll convert that. And it's not too far. Oh, how thick is that going to be to have a 24 inch slope style bike? Yeah. 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 You guys, you guys, you guys, so he did half a day of, uh, we did, uh, went locally, uh, not locally, but about an hour from here. There's, he did half a day of like dirt jump. And then there's a brand, there's a brand new trail network that has just, it's a one way flow trail, um, in, uh, High Bridge, New Jersey. So he did like, he rode seven miles of pump track and, and, uh, and, uh, flow trail. So like pushing his dirt jumper or his reeb up the hill, uh, and then coming well he's riding the reeb up the hill, pushing the dirt jumper up the hill, um, and then coming down. It was like a f four or five minute run. He rode seven miles, and then we went and rode single track, like good single track after it. And he was like hitting doubles and gap jumps, and like just that that warm up on the the pump track was just fantastic for the afternoon ride. And of course there was. Uh, he got ice cream at the end of it, and I had an IPA, so it was perfect. It was the perfect day. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're a couple minutes early. So we should wrap this thing up at nine o'clock. But we have anything else to talk about here? No. Anybody can come to our store and check out the bike too. It's uh, I can always make it available. So if there's anybody lo local. Yeah, tell us where tell us where you're located. You right. have you have a you have a fleet, you have a medium and a large squeeze. If anybody wants to demo that in the New York area, yeah, I'm I'm I think as as soon as Adam has some free time, I'm going to probably put a large uh, ridiculous in there as well. Uh, um, yeah, and so um, for you and anybody that's listening, our, our ridiculous frames uh, we have cut and prepped, uh, ready to weld. So. It is a frame that uh, moves through the queue a little bit faster than our other bikes right now. Um, I, have, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, for do you, are they, do you, you don't pre-drill the holes for the dropper post, do you? Uh, we usually do, but there may be one that isn't drilled. Yeah, keep keep that one for me. Why are you going to build an axis ridiculous? Move the part, the, the parts over from that bike that you constantly give me grief about over to a ridiculous as, as it should be. Nice. Yeah, we can definitely make that happen. I'm sick of hearing shit about that bike. That's sorry. That... <laughs> Noah, earmuffs. Okay. Hey, Noah, don't you think that you <laughs> and your dad should have matching bikes, right? Yeah, we should. You want to know why? Because then when you smoke him, you, he can't blame it on having a <laughs> less equipment bike. However, if he does get on a ridiculous, you might have to step up your game a little bit to, to keep your old man back. <laughs> you think you got what it takes? Of course I do. Smoke this him now. Smokes me now, yeah. <laughs> nice. 
That's awesome. Well, how about uh, how, you guys need an e? You're going to need to make me an e ridiculous at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know hey. about that. I know. I don't know. About that. I keep. T- I keep telling Adam <laughs> that we need to make a squeeby, a squeeby, <laughs> like a elect an e slope bike or something. Not a, not a go. Please don't do that. Like a, like a gnarly e bike. No, yeah. we'll we'll make a rad dirt bike first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just. Adam will come up with like a bike that just is like a mini two stroke engine. So at least like you just like drip a little gas in it and it gets you to the top of the hill. Exactly. Like you fill a water bottle and just shoot it in there, use it as needed. That'd yeah. be that'd be a little cooler. Yeah. No, no electronic start. Like it just it's like a rolling uh jump start. Right, bump start only. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for ha- thanks for coming on with us, guys. Uh, if you're watching, I'll be back on next Wednesday with Adam. We're switching. This is our last Thursday. Next week, we'll be resuming on Thursday because there's lots That's of rides right. that go on on Tuesday nights and Thursday. They have the rebromp, and hopefully they're getting back to that soon. So we want to free up Thursday nights so that we could actually go ride our bikes and not just talk about bikes. So next Wednesday, come back here. We'll be chatting again. But thanks to Shepard and Noah, and Adam and I will be back next week. What are we talking about next week? I forget. If it's, we we have a whole spreadsheet of topics. And I can't. I don't have it in front of me now. I think it's either might be the lick skillet, gravel bikes. It always deteriorates fast. We had no. You you were on today, so you kept us on our good behavior, Noah. Normally we start talking about something and then we deteriorate faster. We're trying to keep a good positive image for today's youth with you on here today. Yeah, I, uh, I think tentatively uh, next week will be um, next week. Uh, either next week or the following week will be gravel bikes. All right. Yep. So. Come back here to talk about bikes, beer, gravel, whatever. It'll be it'll be P, it won't be PG next week. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, Noah. Thanks for joining us. Shepard, awesome. And great yeah. bike again. Great, great company. Great bikes. All right. We will see you all next week. Later, guys. Thanks. See ya. Later. Bye.